All right, since it is Christmas Sunday, I thought that we could do a little uh, intro today, and I thought that we could uh, turn to the people around you. I mean, you just prayed with them, so you guys are comfortable with each other a little bit. But turn to them and ask them this question without thinking too much, okay? Just, just whatever comes to mind. But on a, on a scale of 1 to 10, okay, a level of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest, how would you rate your Christmas spirit this season? Let's ask each other. Okay, don't think too much about it. Just, just ask each other. On a level of 1 to 10, how would you rate your Christmas spirit this year? <laughs> Shouldn't take too long to answer. You just have to give a number. Okay, you guys are getting into lo too long of a dialogue. I don't know what's, what you're talking about, but it should just be a number. <laughs> Okay, okay, time's up, time's up, time's up. You guys are getting into discussions. I don't know what you're talking about, but anyway. How many of you, anybody say a 10? Anybody was like a 10? Oh, like two people back there, 10, yeah. All right, anybody, how, about, how many of you were above a five? Okay, maybe about 20% of you. How many of you were below a five? Okay. Was anybody a one? Anybody, oh man. She quickly put her hand down. Somebody give her a hug, like right now. Is that Chen? <laughs> give her a hug right now. Um, you know, it's, it's a very common thing around this time of year to ask this question. You know, like, let's get into the Christmas spirit, right? People talk about the Christmas spirit. And uh, this week, I was very curious about how it is that we are supposed to get into the Christmas spirit according to the world. How do we get into this Christmas spirit? And so I went to my favorite search engine, Google, and I typed in, how do you get yourself into the Christmas spirit? And the very first result that came up was a WikiHow article. Thank God for WikiHow, right? They answer every question. And it was titled, how to get yourself into the Christmas spirit. I was like, yes, perfect. And let me just read for you the suggestions, okay? And so for, for those of you who are one, Jen, maybe this will help you, okay? But number one, the first thing you should do is you should play Christmas music in the house. How many of you have been doing that? Yeah, I started right after Thanksgiving. That's what I did, right? Number one, we're all doing it. Number two, make a batch of Christmas cookies. Yeah, you're like, I don't have an oven in Korea. <laughs> My house is not big enough. Who has an oven? Get to know Emo, wherever Emo is, all right? She, she'll bake it for you. But number two, you do that. Uh, number three, hang up Christmas ornaments, right? Hang up your tree, right? How many of you guys have it up? Yeah, a lot of you guys have it up. Number four, Put your tree up early. Don't put it up too late. Put it up early. It doesn't say how early, but just put it up early. Okay? Number five, learn a Christmas song. One particularly that you've never heard or your favorite. Learn a Christmas song and sing it. Okay? Now, the list went on. There are a lot of things on this list. Uh, but one of the last things I found interesting on this list that was listed was this. Have reasonable expectations of Christmas season. Yeah, that was like one of the last things there. In other words, don't expect too much of Christmas. Don't do it. And I think, as I was thinking about this, it makes sense. I think the reason why that's there as a suggestion of how to get into the Christmas spirit is because everyone knows that all of these things, as nice and as fun as they are, they can't always lift you into the Christmas spirit. Whatever that really means, they can't do it. In fact, that baby right now is not in the Christmas spirit, right? <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. Um, but in, in fact, in the comments section below, you know, there's a comment section where people get to write comments on this article. One of the questions that was listed was, what do you do if these methods don't work? What do you do? Right? What do you do? And there was an answer. And the answer was simply a list of more things to do. Okay, for example, maybe you should decorate while listening to Christmas music. Try that. That might help, okay? Or, or go on a wintry vacation. Go somewhere with snow. That will help your Christmas spirit, okay? Or watch Christmas movies, right? Elf, Home Alone, whatever you like. Watch these things. It will help your Christmas spirit. And again, none of these things are bad in and of themselves. None of them are bad. But the reality is they don't always work to get us into this Christmas spirit. They don't always work, okay? They, they can get old and boring and predictable 
Okay? And certainly, I can tell you certainly that these things alone will not work to get us into what I believe the Bible describes as the real Christmas spirit. Did you know that there's a real Christmas spirit about Christmas? It's a real thing. And you're probably wondering, what is it? I really want to know what this Christmas spirit is. That's what we're going to talk about today. And so turn your Bibles now to Philippians, the book of Philippians in the New Testament. Philippians chapter 2, a very famous passage. And we will be looking at verses 3 to 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. Uh, which is a passage that I believe tells us clearly, first of all, what the Christmas spirit actually is, but also, maybe more importantly, how we should and can have it. We should and have the Christmas spirit. And so uh, let's look at this text now, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. And uh, I thought, I've I've done this in, in a I think a couple weeks ago, uh, I thought it would be good for us on Christmas Sunday, since we are celebrating the Lord's birthday, to reverence and honor him in his word. Can we all stand together? If you are able, if you've got like a sprained ankle or your hamstring sore, that's okay. You can sit down. But for the rest of us who have strength in our bodies, um, just as a sign of, of reverence and awe and respect, worship even to the holy word of God, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to read this for you. You can just listen and read along, okay? But... This is the word of the Lord. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the heaven, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that some 2,000 years ago you sent your son Jesus Christ to come to pay the ransom for our sins on the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming for saving us so that now we could stand here before you as righteous sons and daughters, as accepted by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we could run into your arms and cling to you and serve and obey you. We can know you. We can be reconciled with you. We thank you for the most wonderful gift of Christmas. Thank you. I do not know what else to say, but thank you. And we pray today that, Lord, as we listen to your holy word, as we submit ourselves to what your word says, that you would take pleasure in that. It would glorify you, bring you worship, Lord. So I pray, Lord God, that every heart here would prepare you room, even right now, especially, Lord, if our hearts have been cluttered with all the other stuff of Christmas. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would wash those things out of our minds, out of our hearts, and allow us to be centered upon your word, to have our minds fixed on you, the Christ of Christmas. Help us for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so once again, this passage, uh, I believe, it gives us one of the best descriptions of what the Christmas spirit actually is because it gives us an incredibly amazing look into the mind of the one who came at Christmas, the one who Christmas is all about, which of course we know is Jesus Christ. You guys know, right, Christmas is about Jesus Christ, him alone. And so in this passage, we see the mindset, or some translations say the attitude, literally the mind of Christ at Christmas. 
we are told what Jesus was thinking at Christmas, why he did the things that he did. In other words, this passage tells us about the real Christmas spirit, the spirit of the Christ at Christmas. And what is that spirit? It's pretty much summed up in two words, humility and selflessness. Humility and selflessness. Let me read to you again verses 3 to 5, the beginning of our passage. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is the true Christmas spirit. Humility and selflessness. Now, I want you to turn to your neighbor again, and I want you to ask them, how is your Christmas spirit this season? On a level of 1 to 10, how is it? You don't have to really do this. You don't have to answer because some of you are like, man, my number just dropped, right? Big time, like, boo, right? Right? But that's what the true Christmas spirit is all about. It is about humility, thinking less about yourself and more about others. It's about selflessness, considering the interests of others and not just our own interests. That is the true spirit of Christmas because it was the exact mindset of Jesus Christ when he came at Christmas. He came in total humility. He came in total selflessness. Now, the question is, at least that I'm asking, how on earth can we have that spirit? How in the world can we have that spirit? Because let's be honest, it ain't easy, right? Right, right, it was just me? It ain't easy. In fact, most of the time it feels impossible, right? Anyone here oozing with the Christmas spirit right now? Anyone just oozing with it? Level 10, it's like humility, selflessness, nailing it, I got it. All day, every day, like the moment I wake up, the first thing I think about is other people. Who can I pray for today? Who can I bless today? Who can I be generous today? That's always on my mind. Anybody oozing with it? Probably not, right? Myself included. It, the reality is this is really, really hard because we have a strong tendency to first think about me. What do I need to do today? What am I going to get for Christmas this year? When am I, where am I going to go on the holiday season? It's all about me, myself, and I. So the question is, how can we have the Christmas spirit? We know what it is, but how can we have it? How can we have the same mindset as Christ Jesus? How? And we're going to talk about the answers, thank God. First of all, the very first answer in fact, the first most basic foundational answer is this. You already have it. You already have it. Let me explain. If you are a Christian, I'm talking to the Christians in this room. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the first thing that you need to know and you need to believe is that this mindset, it already belongs to you. You already possess this mindset. You already have it. Because look again, did you notice what verse 5 said? Let me read for you again verse 5. Paul says this, Have this mind among yourself, which is whose? It is yours. He's talking to Christians. It is yours in Christ Jesus. Elsewhere, Paul, he, he's talking, you know, talking to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, he says, we have the mind of Christ. We have it. If you are a Christian, you have the mind of Christ. Now, some of you are asking, really? Seriously, I have the mind of Christ? I don't feel like I have the mind of Christ. I feel like I got my own mind thinking of my own things, right? How can I really have the mind of Christ? Are you serious? The answer is, it's because of the Holy Spirit. 
That's how. You see, one of the, for the Christian, one of the things that happened the moment that we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, the moment that happened, the Holy Spirit of God, whom Paul says is the only one who knows the thoughts of God. Did you know that? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. One of the things that happened the moment that you accepted Jesus Christ, became a Christian, that same Spirit of God took residence in your heart. He lives in you, giving us now the ability to discern, to understand, to know, to have the very thoughts of God. That belongs to you as a Christian. Before we were Christians, before any of us were Christians, this was impossible. It was impossible. Without the Holy Spirit, we could never know God. And not only that, but we would never even want to know God, the Bible says, without the Holy Spirit. But now we have the mind of Christ. It is ours in Christ Jesus who dwells in us and promises to never leave us or abandon us. It, we have it. Believers have the mind of Christ. I want you to turn to one another and tell each other, you have the mind of Christ. Tell that to each other. The only question, the question is not, do I have the mind of Christ? That's not the question. You do if you're a Christian. The only question is, will you choose now to follow it, to live according to it, to activate it, if you will. Will you choose that? Because on the one hand, yes, it is absolutely true. We have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit lives in us. We have that. But on the other hand, it's also true that we are called to have it. We have the mind of Christ, but we are called to have it. Some of you are like, oh, that makes no logical sense. How can we have the mind of Christ, but we need to have it? I know it doesn't make sense, but that's what the Bible says. (laughs) Once again, verse 5. Do you see what he says? Have this mind among yourself. What is that? That's a command, right? Have the mind of Christ. And then he says, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, you already have the mind of Christ, but now have it. I know, it doesn't work out logically in our brains. Some of us are really confused right now, but that is how Christianity actually works. The Bible talks like this all the time. Okay. The Bible says things like, you are saved already by the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, now live saved. Right? The Bible talks about how um, we... You are a holy saint already. You're holy. You're blameless before God. Now act holy. Live holy lives. Be blameless as your Lord and Savior Jesus is. The Bible says you're a son and a daughter already. You've been adopted into the family of Christ. Now act like a son and a daughter. You have the mind of Christ, but have it now. The Bible talks like this. This is how Christianity operates, actually. What God has done for us in Christ comes before what we do for him now. Always. I've said this before. Your identity in Christ, it comes before your activity for what you do for Christ now. If you mix that order up, it's not Christianity anymore. Mix that order up. Okay? In other words, Christianity is not you obey, 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 and then you get saved. No, 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 no. It is Christ has saved you. Now live this way. That's Christianity, okay? And so the reason I'm saying this clearly is I want to just say, especially for those in this room that are not believers in Jesus Christ, if you're not a believer, I'm talking to you right now, okay? Please understand that the message for you today is not be selfless. Be humble. Have the Christmas spirit like Jesus had. That's not the message for you today because that can never save you from your sins, No matter how hard you try to be a good person, it can't save you from your sins. The only thing that can save you from your sins is Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross for you. 
And so the only thing that you need to do if you're an unbeliever is not this. That comes later. The first thing you need to do is you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and put your faith in him. Believe in him for the, the, the forgiveness of your sins. And so I, if you're an unbeliever, I, I sincerely pray that you hear me right now. That's what you need to do. And, and I pray and I hope that you would do that today because that invitation is open to you right now. Forgiveness of all of your sins by what Jesus Christ has done for you. Okay? But for the believers, okay, now I'm talking to the believers, those of you who already have the mind of Christ. You have given your heart to the Lord Jesus. You believe that he is the Lord. You've confessed it and you've surrendered your life to him. For us, the call now is to have the mind of Christ, to think like he thinks, to live according to his thoughts, to have the Christmas spirit of humility and selflessness. Why? Because that's what Jesus Christ has done for you. That's what he's done for me. That's what he's done for all of us. Now I know the question still remains, how can we do this? It's so hard. It's so, so hard. How can we have the mind of Christ? And I believe that the greatest encouragement, in fact, the greatest power that we have to live this way, I believe it comes from looking into the mind of Christ, seeing what Jesus was thinking about at Christmas, seeing what he did and why he did it, seeing that, the mind of Christ. And that's actually where Paul goes next in our passage. And so we're going to go there. Look at verse 6 now. Okay, so look at verse 6. He's just told us to have the mind of Christ. And then he says this, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, grasped there, it doesn't mean that he didn't have it and he's trying to get it. It doesn't mean like he doesn't have equality with God and so he's grasping for it. Like, I want that. That's not what it means. It means that he had it but he didn't keep it. He gave it up. You see, Jesus Christ, you need to know, Jesus Christ had all the glory of heaven. He had all the glory in the universe. The Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ, he is equal with God the Father. Equal. The exact imprint of the nature of God, the book of Hebrews tells us. The one in whom all, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, Colossians 1.19 tells us. So it's not like the Father is like up here and then below is Jesus and then, you know, Holy Spirit down here, like, Holy Spirit, what does he do? He's like way down. It's not like that at all. No. They're one. Equal in essence and being. Jesus was and is fully God. In all his glory, he had all the glory of heaven. He had everything, which means if you have everything, it means you don't need anything, do you? He needed nothing at all, nothing. And yet, he did not count equality with God a thing to be kept. But instead, verse 7 tells us, but he emptied himself. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He emptied himself. Now, you got to understand that for God to become a man, it is an emptying of infinite proportions. Infinite proportions. I mean, there is simply no greater condescension than this. None that we could even imagine. Nothing else compares to this because think about this. He is the eternal one, the eternal one, which means he was before anything ever existed. He always was. There was never a time ever in which he did not exist, ever. And now that fact alone, just that fact alone, it puts him in a category all by himself, doesn't it? Like 
Nothing else fits that bill. Is there anything else in all creation that we could say uh, existed for all of time, like wasn't created? Nothing. Only him. Everything else is a created thing. And yet, the infinite, uncreated creator becomes a finite human being. It is an emptying of immeasurable proportions. You need to understand this. It is not a small matter that he became a man. Now, this doesn't mean that that God stopped being God when he became a man. I know some people talk about that. that. That's not what it means. It means that he became a man as well. He put on flesh and bones, if you will. He was fully God and fully man at the same time. That's why we call him the God man. He was both. And if you think about it, the only reason that people didn't die when they saw him is because he was veiled in the flesh. He, he looked like you and I, like a normal human being. That's why people didn't die when they saw him, the glory of God. But you remember the story of what happened at the transfiguration? Okay, if you know your Bibles, at the transfiguration, when Jesus was transfixed for a moment, his glory was revealed before his disciples. You remember what happened when that veil was removed for just an instance so the disciples could see who he really was? Matthew tells us the disciples, they fell on their faces and they were terrified. That's what Matthew says. And the reason is, that's what happens when you get even a glimpse of the holy, awesome Almighty God, you fall on your face and you're terrified because he's holy. He's God in all of his glory. And so Jesus Christ, becoming a man, veiling in flesh, he emptied himself big time for us, being born as a man. And not just any man. I mean, it just goes even more. It says he came as a servant. Literally, the word is a slave. He came as a slave. I mean, you think about it. God could have come any way, any way that he wanted. He could have came with strength. He could have came with power. That's how I would have come, right? As a mighty warrior, as a mighty king with authority, with supreme authority, a supreme ruler. But instead, he came as a slave. And that tells us that he came to serve, not to be served, to serve. He didn't come to meet any of his own needs. And the answer why he didn't do that is because he had no needs. He's God Almighty. He doesn't have any needs. He came to serve your needs, my needs. He came to serve our needs. He came to serve us. And how did he serve us? Look at verse 8. And here's what I believe ought to greatly encourage us to have the Christmas spirit to live in humility and selflessness. Look at Christ's mind at Christmas. See why he came at Christmas. Verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He came to do what we all fail to do, which is to obey God. That's what we were all called to do. That's why God created us, to obey him. We all failed at that. He comes to do what we could never do, what we didn't do, to do the will of the Father, to live the life that we all should have lived and to die the death that we all deserve for our sins, even death on a shameful, disgraceful Appalling cross. There was no worse way to die than on the cross. No worse way. He came to take our place. It should have been you on that cross. It should have been me up on that cross. That's what we all deserve for our sins. We deserve to die. But Jesus, he humbles himself, even though he's absolutely perfect. He humbles himself, and he dies for us. And by the way, don't forget, he did this willingly. He says in John, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. No one is forcing him to do this. It's not like the father's in heaven. It's like, do this. I command you. Okay, I'll do it. No. He wanted to do this. 
He wanted to do the will of God. Why? Why could he possibly want to do this? It's because he's perfect. That's why. He's absolutely perfect. Not only does he love God perfectly, he loves God perfectly, he loves you perfectly. He loves his neighbor perfectly. He loves me perfectly. He loves all of us perfectly. He is absolutely perfect. He's the one who does nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. He's the one in whom humility counts us more significant than himself. He's the one that looks to our interests above his own. Does this not encourage you now to do the same for him? Doesn't this encourage you when you realize what he has done for you, that he himself has laid his life down for you? He humbled himself, sacrificed himself so that you could live. Doesn't this make you want to do the same, to have the same mind for him? This ought to encourage us. This ought to exhort us to have the mind of Christ because he himself had it for you. He himself had it for us. And if that's not enough, to encourage you. Notice now what happened as a result of Christ's perfect obedience. This ought to further encourage us to have his Christmas spirit. Look at verse 9, and we're going to finish the passage here, verse 9 to 11. Therefore, because of all of this, because of his Christmas spirit, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you see what happened as a result of his perfect obedience? His utter humiliation led to his glorious exaltation. In the eyes of the world, he was a total failure. He died on a cross. That's a failure in the eyes of the world. In the eyes of the world, failure. But in the eyes of God, he is the highly exalted son of the living God who has the name above every other name. Because of Jesus' Christmas spirit, there is now, according to this passage, there is now coming a day when every single created being, from the angels in heaven to every single human being on earth to even every demon in hell in the ground, one day every knee, without exception, will bend before the name of Jesus in recognition that he is the king, the name above every other name. And every tongue will confess and admit that he's the Lord. He's ruler. He's supreme to the glory of God the Father. This is how the kingdom of God operates. In order to go higher, you got to go lower. The way to go up in the kingdom of God, you got to go down, down, down. Humility, selflessness, thinking more about others, less about ourselves, serving rather than being served, that is the way to real glory. That's the way. Listen to what Peter says, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 6. Clothe yourselves, all of you, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may what? Exalt you. He may exalt you. It is completely opposite of how the world works, right? The world's message is, man, if you want to go up, uh, you got to do whatever yourself, to, whatever you got to do to get yourself up. Put yourself ahead. Think about yourself. Advance yourself. Do at whatever cost. Get yourself ahead of the game. It's all about you. You, you. But the economy of God's kingdom is completely different. To go up, you got to go down. Humility and selflessness, that is the pathway to God exalting you in his kingdom. And let me remind you all that his kingdom is the only one that's going to last. 
His kingdom is the eternal kingdom. Every other name, every other kingdom, every other power, it's going to bow to the name of Jesus, as we even see in this passage. Only Jesus will remain. So we better learn how to get on his agenda right now. We better get on his game plan. We better learn right now his ways, his mind, his thinking, because that's the only one that's going to last. And not only that, it's the one that is going to exalt us to glory with him forever. Amen. And so to end, I wanted to exhort us to practice the Christmas spirit this week. And I say practice because this does not come naturally for any of us, does it? We are so prone to selfishness and pride, aren't we? So prone to that. It's much easier to think about ourselves and be selfish, even at Christmas. And so I thought we should practice this spirit at Christmas. And what a perfect week to practice, as it is Christmas week. In a few days, it will be Christmas. And of course, I'm not saying that we only need to have this spirit at Christmas. No, this is the Christian spirit, if you will, for the rest of our lives. We live as Christ did for us in humility and selflessness. And so I want to exhort us, Christians, practice the Christmas spirit. Now, I don't know what that's going to look like for all of us. It will look different for every single one of us. But as the Spirit of God leads us, as the, as the wonderful counselor leads us, as we pray and seek him, I want you to ask him, how, how can I practice the Christmas spirit this week? If you're willing, if you're able, if you desire this, if the Spirit of God is convicting your heart right now, ask him. And, and again, I don't know how it'll look. Maybe it's going to look different for every person, how you can serve others, how you can think about others. Perhaps it is with your time. Maybe for some of you, there's a way that you can serve someone with your time. Maybe you can hang out with a friend that you know is lonely at Christmas. Call them up. Hey, let's get some coffee together rather than binge watching Home Alone 1, 2, 3 <laughs> by yourself, you know, rather than doing that. That's easy. Right? But maybe you can sacrifice your time. Think about others. For others, it's money, maybe. Maybe there's someone that you know that is in need, that needs it way more than you do, and you say, you know what, I'm going to serve this person. I'm going to be generous to this person instead of buying myself this nice toy. I'm going to think about others this Christmas season. For those of you with family, it, it could be serving your spouse, maybe doing a, a chore that you don't usually do, like, oh, that, that's my husband's duty, but I'm going to do that this week. That's my wife's duty, but you know what, I'm going to serve her. Right? Maybe it's that. For those of you with kids, maybe it's serving your children playing with them, looking at them in the eyes. This convicts me. Looking at the eyes instead of looking at the phone and playing with them, you know? We do that a lot. Maybe you can serve your children that way. But I don't know. It could look so many different ways. For some of you, maybe it's getting involved in church, finally. Deciding, I'm going to serve the church, finally. I'm not just going to come, but I'm going to serve. I'm going to uh, serve people as Jesus served me. It could be so many different ways, but I want to encourage you to pray and ask the Lord this week, how can I serve how can I have the Christmas spirit as you've had for me? But the last thing I want to say is never forget, do not forget the underlying reason why we ought to seek to have the Christmas spirit. Don't forget that part. That is the most important part. We seek to have the Christmas spirit because it is the spirit of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us at Christmas. And so just to, uh, to end on that note, to kind of remember and celebrate and think about even more what Jesus has done for us, I've asked the worship team to lead us in a song. And so I want to invite us to rise together right now. It's from your heart to your Savior, just to give thanks that he has come for us, that he did not leave us without hope. He did not leave us in the darkness of our sin that though he had equality with God, all the glory of heaven, he did not count it something to be grasped and held on to, but he looked at us and he counted us more significant than himself. He humbled himself for you and for me, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's how far he went to get us. Just allow thanksgiving to rise from your heart to him. Just take a moment, even if it's a simple thank you, Jesus. 
Where would I be without you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we honor you. We thank you. You are the embodiment of true humility and selflessness. You did what we didn't do. You lived the life that we were called to live, and you died for our sins, the sins that we committed against our Creator. Thank you for taking our place. Thank you for counting us more significant than yourself, choosing willingly to die for us, not to just leave us. You could have left us to just die. You have all the glory in heaven. You didn't need us at all. But because of your perfect character, because of your perfect love, you came for us. And so we just give you thanks. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us a new hope in you, a new life in you, an abundant life. And help us now to live with the mind of Christ that you've given us. Help us now to live the way that we ought. By the power of your spirit, help us now to live as you live for us. Give us that strength. We confess we are so weak. We are so easily selfish and prideful. So easily. We need your help, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you, you will never abandon us. It's not like you see our pride and selfishness and you're like, I'm out of here. <laughs> That's not the God that you are. You're faithful. When you say you're here to stay, you're here to stay. You will never abandon us. You will work even through the sin that we continue to commit to sanctify us, to make us more like Christ. And so we pray that even this week would be a step in that direction. Holy Spirit, move us to obedience. Move us to live the lives that we were meant to live, the lives that we've now been called to live, the new life we've been given. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. Help us to live that way. Help us. For the glory of your name, Lord Jesus. And let it be joy for your people. You came to give us life abundantly, not for us to die, but for us to have life. And so I pray that as we obey you, as we seek to, as we strive to listen to you, to have your mind, that we would see it is joy for the Christian. Help us, God, believe. Help our unbelief. Help us to believe. God, we give you this worship we give you our lives we pray lord that everything that even comes out of this service lord the the acts of worship that we devote to you that it would be pleasing to you done in the right spirit not in a legalistic self-righteous we have to do this but a spirit that desires to please our lord and savior who died for us i pray that it would be the right spirit we pray these things for your glory again in jesus name we pray amen <laughs>